can start. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be better. Yes, they, they can see you. All right, I have another talk on a similar topic. Um, so I'm going to speak about PD, which is a code package that uh, Andrea Cepalotti and I and some others from the Kaczynski group at Harvard University have been developing over the last year or so. Ah, all right, so um, in writing this code, our goal, we want to compute transport properties. It's something that's um, really central to the focus of some of the things we do in the Kaczynski group. So we want to compute transport properties uh, such as traditional things like the electrical conductivity when we apply an electric field, or when we apply a thermal gradient, the thermal conductivity or thermal electric effects. Uh, traditionally, these kinds of calculations have been done um, using the Boltzmann transport equation. So uh, to set up the Boltzmann transport equation, we look at how the particle distribution function labeled here as F uh, changes in respect to this applied field. Uh, so we want to con consider contributions such as um, if we apply an external force, uh, we get some term like this, um, or changes due to a thermal gradient, um, as well as changes due to particle collisions. In solving the Boltzmann transport equation, we want to consider the point at which the system has reached equilibrium, uh, and we want to linearize the Boltzmann transport equation. And then we can, uh, in the formalism of, of DD and the formalism we're interested in solving this problem in, rearrange uh, the Boltzmann transport equation into a matrix equation. So here we have these uh, force and diffusion terms uh, going into this vector B and all of the contributions related to particle scattering going into the scattering matrix, which we have labeled here as A. Uh, so to attempt to solve this problem, uh, what we're interested in solving for is this solution vector, the uh, delta F term, which is related to the out of, particle, uh, out of equilibrium particle distribution. And we can use that to calculate um, transport properties, uh, transport coefficients that we're interested in. So while this problem is set up in a nice and, and easy to look at way, it is, a, it is a difficult computational problem to solve for lots of reasons. Um, certainly we've seen in the last talk also about um, the calculation of particle interactions is difficult. The, the calculation of the scattering matrix um, is, is computationally burdensome. Um, additionally, the scattering matrix uh, can be very large and, and you have to come up with a good computational framework to solve the problem. So we have done this by writing this code, uh, which we have called BD. Um, as I said, it's been an effort in the Kaczynski group over the last few years. Uh, we have named it BD because it is a, a package of phonon and electron Boltzmann equation solvers. Uh, and the goal of BD is to offer basically a, a range of BT solvers, um, which vary in cost and accuracy to suit the specific needs of your material transport problem. Uh, we have written it to be extremely high performance computing oriented. Uh, we have focused a lot on making sure it is a parallel as possible, and we've also implemented GPU capabilities. Uh, and additionally, it is written in C++, uh, and we have done this to provide sort of a suite of objects which are useful to uh, add future developments, basically. While I can't get into every single thing that Phoebe can do in the content of this talk, um, sort of an overview of the contributions to transport coefficients that we offer, I'm going to show here. So. Uh, we are able right now to calculate um, contributions from electron phonon interactions as well as phonon phonon uh, interactions. Um, and this gives us a, a pretty broad range of the contributions to transport properties that we're interested in, as I listed on the first slide our electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and CVEC coefficient. Uh, additionally, we have some sort of special features. We can also output electron and phonon viscosities, uh, which are relevant to hydrodynamic systems. Uh, and can calculate um, contributions to the transport coefficients related to uh, the Wigner distribution. Um, in addition to this, we have what's called the electron phonon average approximation, something that has been developed um, by Boris Kaczynski in the past, which can sort of uh, do accelerated electron phonon calculations. So the overarching way that Phoebe works, uh, we first perform some calculations using density functional theory, density functional perturbation theory, to calculate the electron and phonon properties um, and any interaction matrix elements that you need to do the calculation. Uh, and then we go and calculate scattering rates. We fill in the scattering matrix 
and we use one of our solvers to um, solve the BTE and find the resulting transport coefficients. Uh, while that setup is similar to other codes, we, um, we are also doing something that is familiar. We're using this electron phonon bonding interpolation procedure. So something that we've seen before, but uh, we take the electron phonon matrix elements in the coarse grid. Currently, we're using quantum espresso to calculate them. Uh, you do a Vanier function calculation. And um, the critical step is going to be taking these electron quantum matrix elements, transforming them from the block space where they're calculated to the real space on your basis, and then back transforming them to an arbitrary mesh of wave vectors so that um, you can converge uh, green zone integrations, which are required for the scattering rates on very fine k-point meshes. So a familiar process. Um, when you say, okay, the workflow, the electron phonon calculation, this is similar to other codes. What is different? Why did you do all of this to write PV? Um, the first point we want to make is this full scattering matrix approach gives us access to some BTE solvers, which would otherwise not be possible. Uh, we're doing these calculations for phonons and electrons. Basically, every feature we have can be done for both in the same way. Uh, this is nice because it allows us access to thermoelectric um, predictions of things like the figure of merit, where you also need the phonon contributions. Um, and additionally, there are some transport properties where you need information both about phonon transport um, and electron phonon transport, so like phonon drag um, or the thermal conductivity of metals. Additionally, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we are focusing a lot on making sure that this code package is as high performance computing oriented as possible. So we've written it in C++ and one of the things that that gives us access to is some um, really useful libraries for acceleration. Uh, the library we have uh, really leaned on is called Cocos. Um, Basically, what this allows us to have is a performance boost throughout the code, as well as GPU acceleration. Um, and it allows us to have this basically regardless of the underlying hardware that you want to run the code on. So Cocos handles all of the interface with the architecture, all of the optimization related to architecture, and we just get to write one piece of code that works on everything. Um, additionally, we have some comments that are important about the way we have affixed the gauge in our DFT calculation. Um, when we do this funny interpolation, it makes it so that we hope in the future, although we're currently interfaced with Fonda Espresso, uh, in any DFT code where the funny function and electron quantum matrix element uh, information was available, we could uh, perform a state fixing procedure and also interface with other codes. So just a few slides on this, as it is an important point for us. Um, if we can return to the electron quantum matrix elements, uh, we, we notice a problem when we want to do this interpolation that is sort of, uh, sort of tricky. When you do a calculation in quantum espresso, the gauge of the wave function is essentially a random number. So that means that when you do a calculation with quantum A90, uh, you're not dealing with the same wave function that you had when you did the density functional perturbation theory calculation. Um, and this means that you can't just interpolate uh, the electron quantum matrix elements in a, in a simple way. You have to deal with this uh, gauge problem. So there are some different workarounds. Um, so one which has been used by other codes is after you have calculated um, the changes to the potential and the Vani function information, you can recompute the electron quantum matrix elements. Uh, but we have what we have done, which is a little bit different, is we have um, initially selected a gauge in at the start of our DFT calculation and then used the same gauge in uh, the further parts of the electron phonon calculation. So the modification we have made, so the the First thing to look at the standard workflow of quantum espresso. Um, at each step in what we would need to do to calculate the matrix elements, there is um, a different gauge basically. So the gauge used in the SCF calculation, the density functional perturbation theory calculation, and SCF to quantum 90 it's different. Um, this is because quantum espresso is is computing the wave function on demand, and and we have different um, gauge information at each point. It leads us to this gauge mismatch problem, which we have to address. And the way that we have done this, um, we have applied basically, we, we ship VD basically with a patch to quantum espresso that you can apply. Um, and what this does is when you run the very first SCF calculation, we write information about the plane wave coefficients that contains our gauge information. Um, as a reference, uh, we save it only for the irreducible K points. And then when we run further calculations, we read that information in and we rotate uh, the irreducible K point uh, plane wave coefficients to uh, whatever other points we need to perform the calculation. And what this enables us to do is that at the end of the day, we do not have to recompute the electron quantum matrix elements um, 
on the full k-point mesh, we can just use the ones which were done for the irreducible mesh. Uh, so this is a nice way that we get some additional acceleration in PD. All right, so to return to the sort of workflow, um, we comment that we, we perform our DFT calculation with this fixed gauge, then we can proceed, take in our matrix elements, calculate our scattering matrix, and then solve for our transport coefficients. Um, to just cover kind of the basic range of solvers that we offer in CD, um, we go from the constant relaxation time approximation, the absolute bare minimum, where you're not even relying on this electron phonon matrix elements or anything like that. Um, we offer this electron phonon average approximation solver that just uses the coarse electron phonon matrix elements and does not do any additional interpolation, but so still get some pretty accurate results for the transport properties. Uh, we offer the traditional relaxation time approximation solution. In this case, our uh, scattering matrix is just reduced to the, basically the diagonal of the matrix, and uh, we can save some memory by holding it down to that. Uh, then we have some exact solutions to the DT. Uh, so a traditional iterative solver, as well as a variational iterative solver, um, which gives us better convergence is guaranteed to converge. Um, and finally, we have the relaxon solver, which is useful in some specific cases. So in the case where you have perhaps a hydrodynamic system and you want to know about the lifetimes, you really have to go with this one. Now that we have established how we're doing these calculations, what kinds of calculations we offer, we wanted to show one example case um, that we used when we were benchmarking and, and checking through um, all of our capabilities. So we ran the scooterdite uh, cobalt antimonide, which is a relatively large 16 atom unit cell. Uh, we, because we have calculations of the CVEC coefficient conductivity and contributions to the lattice thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity in the same code, we can make a full prediction of the thermoelectric properties of the material. Um, we here have versus temperature, uh, the lattice thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, CVEC coefficient. We can see that they have really nice agreement with the experiment in black and that in this particular case, we didn't get a significant change between the RTA and iterative solvers. Um, we can also take a look at uh, if we vary the doping concentration of the material and look at the electronic properties, so the mobility, the conductivity, and the Seebeck coefficient. Uh, we can see again that if we compare to the experimental points in black that we're getting these really great results and, and we have a lot of confidence in what VD can do at this point. Uh, again, we can use it to come out with the entire uh, thermoelectric figure of merit, which is something that we're particularly interested in doing. All right. So having shown what uh, Phoebe can do and how it does it, I also want to make a comment on our um, computational performance. So here we did some benchmarks with um, a converged electron phonon calculation for gallium nitride. Uh, and we did this for both CPU and GPU capabilities. Uh, we find that basically we have ideal scaling when running on CPUs. Um, and the line on this plot to look at uh, is especially the calculation of the scattering matrix, which is a dashed line. Um, it, is the, the bulk of the calculation that we have to do is the most expensive part. So this is the thing to focus on. And we can see that for the red line without GPUs that we have basically just a following of the ideal scaling line. So as we go up in number of processes, we're um, reducing the time in that way. We are additionally proud to say that uh, when we do this with GPUs, so for this case, up to 64 GPUs, uh, we found that we could have the same kind of nearly ideal scaling and um, that we found um, approximately for this calculation, one GPU gave us uh, the same kind of acceleration as about 100 CPUs. And for one last note on computational performance, some of the way in which we get this performance benefit um, is by accelerating the interpolation of the energies and matrix elements. Uh, so we had to be a little bit clever about how we did this. If you want to do just a single uh, diagonalization and Fourier transform of your Vanier information, uh, it's, it's not going to be really worth putting on a GPU because say you have maybe 10 Vanier functions, uh, N and M is going to be maybe 100 matrix elements. Um, maybe R is something like 100 as well. It's not going to be a huge number. You're kind of limited in the number of parallel threads you can use, and it's not going to be worth moving this calculation onto a GPU. However, um, if you then were to batch over Q points, do a whole bunch of these at the same time, uh, you can then take advantage of the kind of number of threads that are on GPUs and get a pretty significant speed up. So we found that this has been a benefit to us in doing these calculations. And it's um, a similar kind of thing to what we do 
for the electron phonon interpolation when we're calculating the scattering matrix and part of why we get this nice scaling and speed up. All right. So to wrap up the presentation uh, and recap what I've just said, uh, we have developed Phoebe, which is an efficient and GPU accelerated code for phonon and electron Boltzmann equation solutions and transport property calculations. Uh, it focuses on using a full scattering matrix formalism so that we have access to a, a, a comprehensive range, basically, of Boltzmann transport equation solvers. Uh, there's a lot of potential for future developments, we feel. Um, and though I don't have time to go into those here, uh, definitely something that can be added is uh, additional scattering contributions. So if you want to add something like um, electron electron scattering or another kind of um, quasi particle interaction like this, it's something that you can just add onto the scattering matrix and then use the BT solvers in a similar way. Um, and additionally, we're interested in um, coming up with more transport properties and, and other uh, specific effects to study through this code. So then I have to thank the PB team. So first we have to thank Boris, who has provided us a lot of invaluable advice and also tremendous freedom in pursuing this project. Uh, Andrea is absolutely critical to the project. He has really guided the direction of it. I have been a, a key participant in the implementations. And we've had uh, also Anders Johansson, who has uh, helped us out a lot with this COCOS GPU acceleration, and Natalia Fedorova, who helped us with the EPA implementation. So we have, um, Phoebe has been released on archive uh, where you can look at a lot of the details. And we also have a website which has uh, extensive documentation as well as tutorials showing you how to run the code. One thing we also wanted to bring up in the context of this workshop and some things that have been discussed recently, uh, even as early as this morning, when we do these calculations, we need um, a number of files from Von 90. So some list like this that we have to read in. Um, right now we are parsing them sort of manually in C++, which, um, you know, it's fine, it's working, but there might have been an easier way to do this. And uh, additionally, it would be cool if we could have fewer files uh, to read in, if there is some way to even post-process in this information into a single format, um, that would be helpful to us in, in using these pieces of information. Okay, so, then I take any questions about anything in the content of the talk. Thanks so much. Okay, so thank you so much for the very clear talk. Um, we, of course, we are open for questions. Please use your hand. I guess we have already two. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, could you expand a bit? So, so it was very nice to have these slides where you uh, compare the, you know, the features that are different from existing mm -hmm. uh, code. Uh, and so one of the points was this full scattering matrix. Yeah. Um, so can, can you explain, uh, I mean, what do you mean exactly and, and how it's not available? In uh, well, so certainly there are some other codes that also have the full scattering matrix. Um, like I know Phono 3 pi will do that for the Phonon case as well. Um, but definitely we wanted to make sure that this was the, the sort of central piece of the code. We wanted to structure the code around formatting things this way because we felt it was what worked best with the kinds of BT solvers we wanted to implement. So I don't think that's always the case. A lot of times I think there's more focus on um, trying to format things as vectors and, and save memory in this way. We wrote the code so that you can do that, but you can also go to the full scattering matrix and have it um, not something I talk about, but distributed in memory as efficiently as possible and try to keep this calculation, you know, do a lot of things to reduce the size, size of the scattering matrix before you do things. Just a lot of focus on this scattering matrix formalism. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I took a question about your programming language. So most of the, pro in this field, most of the lab programs are written either in Fortran or Python and you're using C++. So could you share your, your experience? So um, yeah, definitely. So there were a couple of reasons we wanted to use C++. And, and one of the key reasons was because there were these different kinds of libraries available to us that we felt would help a lot with the acceleration. So certainly this Cocos library is something that has made it much easier because we did not have to write like, you know, specific CUDA code or something to get the GPU acceleration. Um, so that's a that's an effort at Sandia National Laboratory. It's it's quite a nice project if you haven't looked into it before. But unfortunately, it's not available in Fortran or things like that. So, um, yeah. So some of the library interfaces, and also we we would really like people in the future to develop this code as well. And I, I think a lot of times um, people are now having more experience with things like C plus plus and Fortran when they teach them. So.
Okay. So we have a few more questions, but I have a follow-up question yeah. on this. So I wanted to, if you know, to ask you if you can elaborate a bit more on this Cocos library in the sense that exactly. So one of the biggest problem importing applications to GPUs is not coming up with a clever algorithm, but also you know, learning how to write it. And uh, let's put a Fortran, but then that would only work on some GPUs. So you need so there are all these problems that we all know. And it seems that with this, it's you are sort of solving part of this problem so i was wondering how does it work is it like you know you're calling like a lapak but it's not lapak it's something on gpu or because if, if you need to parallelize say a for loop you still have to do it uh -huh. no matter if you use a library so so it's something that you can add into parts of the code without disrupting the structure too much um it's not quite like open mp but sort of a similar thing where you don't have to write the code in a specific way Okay. around Cocos, other than maybe telling it, you know, some data structures are meant to be on GPUs or something like that. So, are, um, so they say there are directives that you can write a little bit like OpenMP. So it's, it's to say it's closer to OpenMP that you would write things with, with MPI and communicators. And yeah, Andre so. can also elaborate yeah. more on this. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can elaborate a little bit. Um, it's a little bit tricky to explain maybe if you're not overly familiar um with how gpus work but the idea is that you in the code you can write the kernel say the code that is going to exec be executed on the gpu and the library caucus basically provides a way to compile this set of instructions that you provide in the way that works the best for the current underlying architecture so um it's a little bit different than OpenMP. You have actually access to finer uh, and lower level control if you need to. But if you don't, actually, it kind of abstract away a lot of the challenges that you would have if you actually would be using CUDA directly. Yeah. 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 No. The code caucus would actually compile to CUDA if you are using an NVIDIA GPU, but it does support also Intel and AMD uh, GPUs. And essentially, since it's an effort backed by the Sandia National Lab, they actually have an interest of supporting all the major supercomputers that are going to be uh, at least uh, be publicly available in the United States, which covers actually most of the vendors uh, that are available right now. A uh, really nice talk. Thank you. So uh, just two things. The, the, the files that you said it would be good to package them up. I mean, I think once uh, we move to the library, mm -hmm. that becomes quite easy because the, the state of the calculation becomes extremely well defined. And essentially it can be dumped into a file of whatever format you'd like. I don't know how, how urgent that no. issue is for you. No, no, not urgent, but, but it would be much nicer to do it in this way. So yeah, so I mean, perhaps in the future, yeah. Yeah, so once it's library wide, I mean, if Jerome can maybe, it just becomes very easy to, to just dump the entire state of the calculation mm -hmm. in one go. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the gauge fixing because I think this problem isn't just unique to you. This must be something that mm -hmm. people face a lot. Um, so, first question is I should like to find out more in detail how you do it. And, and I guess the second is a, is a comment for maybe others here as well, is it would be really good if, if, say, the electronic structure code had an option where you could switch it on and it uniquely fixed the gauge. It had a criterion that it used to fix the gauge so that every time you ran it, you knew it would be in the same gauge. This is basically why we offer this patch to Quantum Espresso. We've just modified routines like C-bands to output this information and then read it back in. Um, so it's... It is like basically something that you could maybe turn on as an option if it were integrated in Quantum Espresso. Uh, so, so to answer that first question, in terms of the gate fixing, what uh, specific kind of, you know, well, we could talk more afterwards. We had some great discussion about this, uh, all the electron quantum people at lunch, but we can, yeah, if you want, we can do it afterwards and we can answer more specific questions now. Okay, so I see there is a question online, but before that, is yeah. there anyone? Okay, there's one. Thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, my question would be, do you think it would be interesting uh, or also difficult to add uh, the um, possibility to also simulate the presence of an external field in your transport calculation, like a magnetic field or 
something um, like that? So I, I'm working right now on doing some basic magnetic field additions um, in, in some ways that I've been explored a little bit before, but uh, definitely, yes. Yeah, I think it should be very possible um, depending on the method. We've talked about different levels of that. So an external field, certainly, yeah. For the magnetic field, uh, it's, it should just be an addition to the scattering matrix that's like one function to apply. Okay, so there is a question from Sergey online. Does the code allow to refine the K-grid near scattering rate singularity? How large of a K-grid is visible? I'm sorry. This, this is the question. Does the code allow to refine the K-grid near scattering rate singularity? How large of a K-grid is visible? Um, so in terms of, okay, so the second question is easier. How large of a K-grid is feasible? Um, because we have written this to be extremely parallel, as many cores as you have, you can distribute it and you should be okay. <laughs> Um, on the first question, I don't think we have this right now, though I think it could be very possible. Um, the definition of the K mesh in the code, it, we could replace it with something else, and I don't think there would be a problem. There just hasn't been a need for that at this time. Okay, so there's another question from Stefan. Uh, uh, when interpolation involves Fourier transform, I guess you do it as a simple Fourier transform, not as a fast. Fourier. Did you think of using fast Fourier? Uh, no, I don't think so. We're just doing it in the traditional funny okay. interpolation format. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I think we can thank Jenny again. This was, so let me stop the recording now. Uh, yes.